take a seat and then I'll start. Hello. This first story this evening is called The Grinning Gargoyle. It was half term and one moonlit Halloween evening, twins, Georgie and Joe, were on the track through the railway cutting. They'd sneaked out from the holiday cottage to go and do something really exciting to the Abbey at midnight. Something that their parents would never do because the holiday had been so boring. After crossing the bridge, with the river twinkling below, they were passing through the old railway station when Joe heard a rustling and stopped. What's that? he said. Birds, said Georgie. There's lots of them that nest here. Well, Joe wasn't so sure, because he thought that if it was birds, they should be quiet at night and not making sounds. And then looking up, he caught the sound of a gargoyle on the side of the building. Now we'd seen those during the day, but looked very different at night. Georgie, that gargoyle, it moved. Oh, don't be stupid, his sister said. Gargoyles can't move. They're made of stone or wood. See, Georgie knew all about gargoyles because she'd been on a trip at the school to one of those big cathedrals where there's lots of them. Lots of faces all carved. Faces that can be funny or rude or evil, angelic. They might be do -do 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 -do, playing an instrument or they might be sticking their tongue out or they might be picking their noses. And Georgie had been outside too, to look at the top of the cathedrals, where there's those griffins, the ones with the big paws and the big wings, and they've got a hole in the mouth where they take the rainfall. And Miss Taylor, her teacher, had said that they've got special powers, gargoyles and griffins. Sometimes they can fly like dragons, and at night, gargoyles come to life. And she said, Miss Taylor, that a long time ago people used to believe that they could skew time, that they would bring the past into the present. Well, Georgie thought that a long time ago people thought very strange things. So she decided that she's going to go to Joe, grab his arm and drag him down the railway cutting, to get to the Abbey before Mum had missed them. It was eerie in the moonlight, silent. They'd been to the Abbey during the day lots of times, but it was very different now, even with the full moon. Those trees, they look kind of scary at night, said Joe. Georgie sighed. Do you want to go back when we haven't even really started yet? No, of course I don't want to go back, said Joe, striding off. Georgie sighed again. Do we like chalk and cheese? Joe came up with some really brilliant ideas, like this one going to the Abbey, but it won't really enough to do them on their own. Whereas she, well, she'd get into all sorts of scrapes. She'd do anything. She ran to catch him up and she linked his arm and she said, oh, let's not fall out. It's your idea and it's great. Come on, let's have an adventure. So off he went down the cutting. The river glinted through the trees. An occasional bird fluttered by and there was a smell of smoke hanging in the air. They walked slowly, taking everything in, the smells, the sound, the moonlight on the track as they walked past, and the darkness at the edges. And then slowly, they realised that the light in front of them was flickering and moving. And at the same time, the air above them 
It was all moving around like there was the beating of great wings and, and all the tops of the trees all shiver and tremble. I don't like this, whispered Joe, clutching tightly onto George's arm. Overhead, there was a loud boom! And suddenly, above them as they raised their eyes, they could see a strange creature. A grey-green dragon with bright yellow eyes and great claws beating its wings and breathing fire through its nose. Who is trespassing in time? Who dares to invade the past? The creature's head lowered until its eyes were level with theirs. Rooted to the spot, mouths open, Georgie and Joe were voiceless, eyes wide with fear. A swirling fog began to envelop them. They clutched each other even more tighter, and then they heard voices behind them. The yellow eye turned and poured into theirs, and they heard the voice say, The past is now the present. The future is being made. And the words rumbled through the night sky like thunder. Rearing up, the griffin shot flame from its nostrils right across the treetops, burning the lot, but clearing all the fog to the edges of the tracks, revealing that Georgie and Joe, surrounded by, by men in, in white, long, light dresses, they were running, they were screaming, they were crying, and the voices sounded like French to Georgie, who'd done a little bit at school. Mon Dieu, je suis de mes peurs. Oh mon Dieu, je m'aide, je m'aide. And behind the white figures came some men with wild red hair and in things that looked like skirts and trousers that were cut off at the knee. And there was this big, big man with wild red hair and they were running in after the men all dressed in white shouting, Kill them! Kill every one of them! Kill every white cannon that you can find and sack the abbey! Destroy every stone! Well, the white figures, they picked up the long robes and they started running and running and they ran faster and faster and faster and the children couldn't do anything but run along with them because they were surrounded and they had no choice but they were feeling really, really scared and the stampeding men went forward and together they fled along the track towards the abbey. Many fell as they ran, tumbling down, being trampled by others running over them but the screams and the shouts, they were silenced by the wild men with their swords as they passed by. I'm scared. I'm scared, Joe. Georgie panted as they ran along. This is going to be a massacre. Oh, maybe we can hide at the Abbey, Joe said. Just, just, just keep going. But then he felt his skin prickle. As he heard all the wild men chanting. We are Scott, afraid we're not. We good are going to earn our coin, and tonight we will be rich, as every white cannon lies in the ditch. Sack the abbey, kill the white cannon! And the wild men went running after the white cannons and Georgia and Joe. Panting as they turned a corner, the children saw the white figures with swords at the abbey entrance, ready to fight their enemy. Tumbling through the doors, Georgie and Joe saw that inside was complete chaos. There were some cannons who were trying to get all the candlesticks and, and the crosses that were inlaid with precious jewels and pick them up and take them right down to the crypt and hide them underneath the abbey. There were others who were lying down in front of the altar, 
praying and praying. In Nomi Patre, there was Nomi Patre, there was. And there were still others who were trying to find anything that they could, that they could use to defend themselves. And George and Joe, they were just ignored. They were looking around trying to find somewhere to hide. And silently, still shaking with the fear, they tried to edge their way around. Staring at the scene, they became aware of a sinister, echoing laugh. <laughs> and they clutched each other tightly again, scared even more. Wrong place, wrong time. Should have been in bed by midnight's chime. On a bed. Or on a mat, remember what kills the cat. Ha 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 ha. And a green cargo floated in front of them, with his little arms out wide. Thrusting his arms out again, he said, Welcome to history. At that moment, the wild men burst through the door with their swords thrusting and thrusting as they came in, slashing anybody that they could see. And the white cannons, they were trying to defend themselves. But they were sword on sword, and thrusting and parrying, and daggers coming out. And there were red puddles that formed on the floor. And people slipped as things got chopped. And Georgie and Joe stood there, rigid with fear. And then Joe realized, he couldn't hear anything. He could see everybody's mouths shouting and screaming and slashing, but there was no sound. It was like the mute button on the TV had been pushed. Georgie, jump get out of here because I don't like this. I want to go home. Nobody likes this, said the gargoyle. Let it happen. Somewhere, every day, the past is ever present in the future, in the future, in the future, in the future. And the gargoyle floated away again. And at that moment, Joe saw the big wild man with his huge sword come running towards them. And he said, where can we go? So he ran. And he and Georgie tried to push themselves into a side chapel and to stay as small as possible so they wouldn't be heard or seen. And then Joe saw the big man again coming towards them with a big silent And they saw that he picked up Georgie. Georgie! And pushed her even tighter. And then, just as they thought they were safe, they saw the sword coming down towards them. And they screamed as it glinted. No!
but the sun coming through. And off they ran as fast as they could, all the way back down the railway cutting, not looking at the old building as they ran past, not stopping at all, until they got back home. And as they came through the door, the mother said, I thought you two were going for a walk. Uh, you will, we, we have been, said Georgie, trying to move him to the house. Ah, sure, no, you can't have been. I mean, look at the time. You've only been away 15 minutes. Now, that's not enough time for you to get down there. Now, did you see? But Georgie and Joe didn't know that their mum wanted to ask them about who they saw because they slipped past her and went upstairs to the bedroom and flopped on the bed. They were confused. Did they really see what they saw? Was it real? Did it happen? How, how could they have gone out at midnight and come back during the day? Why didn't their mum miss them? Oh, was it really true? What Miss Taylor said? that time can definitely skew and was the past in the present to gargoyles really mean? Well, maybe you already know the answer to that. Maybe you've seen them. Story. Well, I've got one here. It's different to the last one. This one's called Theatrical Spirits. Now, Cashmere was on stage in the old theatre, rehearsing for a musical. She was all alone because all the other actors and crew and singers, they were changing for the next scene. Although the stage manager was just off in the wings. She'd been going to drama school there for years and she knew the front and the back stage really, really well. Like the back of her hand, in fact. But she always felt nervous being on the stage on her own. Even with all the lights on. Today, they were sorting out the sound cues making sure that the songs could be heard. And any effects like <laughs> doors opening, or ding, phones ringing, or woo, woo, barking at the dogs. So they made sure that they all happened at the right time. Kashmir was listening, waiting for the stage manager to tell them when to sing to move, to open the door, to answer the phone. But she was a bit bored because they'd already done it three times. So she was sitting on a chair with her legs dangling, swinging backwards and forwards. And she looked around over to the seats where the audience sat. The girl at the top in a hat, I was watching her. The hat had a feather on it. Long hair covered the shoulders and the top of a green dress. The girl had green hand, gloves on her hands. Cashmere's legs had stopped swinging. Her mouth was open as she looked at the girl. Because the girl was wearing Victorian clothes. And she wasn't anyone that Cashmere knew. Who are you? Cashmere shouted. There was no reply. Are you in fancy dress? Still no reply. The girl never moved. Are you a friend of someone? Silence. Kashmir shouted Sam, the stage manager, to ask if he knew who the girl was. 
He popped his head through the curtain. What girl? That girl, Cashley pointed. The one up there. Well, Sam looked across the seats. All along, moved his head, looking all around all of the seats. And he said, I can't see anyone. And he looked back at Kashmir. Well, you need glasses then, Kashmir said. She's halfway along, row nine. Look up the up there. And she stopped looking, her mouth open again. The seats, they were all empty. But she, she was there. It's like playing tricks on your cash. They do that, the lights, said Sam, disappearing again. Just then, a voice came over the loudspeaker, asking the girls on stage to stop giggling. Sam's head popped through the curtain again, looking round the stage. Confused. No one's giggling, he said into his mic. There's only cash here. A bit of a crackle came over the loudspeaker again. And then the voice again. Sam, that giggling is really loud. We're trying to get, get all the choir ready for cash when she sings. And we can't because of all the girls giggling. The cashmere and the stage manager. They looked at each other. They were confused because they could hear nothing. Is it? There's nobody laughing, said Sam, back into his mic again. Well, you listen to this then, Izzy said. And loud, Hysterical laughter echoed around the stage and the room from the loudspeaker. Well, that's what we can hear, said Izzy. Well, not from here, said Sam. Must be from dressing rooms. As he spoke, Cashmere caught sight of the girl again, up in low age. But this time, she was standing, clapping and clapping and laughing. And holding her stomach so much she was laughing that the tears were running down her face. Oh, she was just so, oh, clapping and laughing. Sam, Sam, said Kashmir, it must be her. She pointed again. And this time, Sam could see her. And he looked up, saw the girl in green, and her mouth opened as she laughed and giggled. There was no sound that could be heard. Right, I'm going to sort this out, said Sam. And he came off the stage, climbed off, and walked over to the steps. And as he was going up the steps, he said, I don't think much of your joke. And as he climbed up to her edge, Cashman watched him muttering about what he was going to do and what about this wrecked rehearsal that had happened. But the girl just ignored him. She just kept on laughing and giggling and holding her stomach and crying. And Sam got to her edge and he turned round. And he moved along towards her to tell her how stupid she was and then what he was going to tell her parents. But when he got there, he's turning and turning. Well, where did she go? He said to Kashmir. And Kashmir was looking up at the same time. And she could still see the standing girl. Clapping and laughing and giggling in tears, pouring down her face. And she could also see Sam. And Sam was turning and turning through, backwards and forwards, through the girl who was still there, laughing and clapping and giggling. 
She could say nothing as she saw it in Kashmir. And then Kashmir began to giggle. <laughs> And laugh, and laugh, and hold her stomach, and she kept her eyes on the girl in row edge. And as she clapped, and the loudest she got, the girl in row edge did. And then Sam started to laugh. <laughs> 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 and, clapped, and laughed, and giggled. And as they both did it, and they both got louder, and louder, and louder. The girl disappeared and there was just Kashmir and Sam in the room. We don't know who the girl in row H was. Maybe she was just lonely for company. Maybe she just wanted somebody to laugh with. I don't know.